Matt Kramer, and uh, I am uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, wildflower schools, uh, and I'm so glad you are all joining me here. Um, I thought I would start maybe by just telling a little story about how I found wildflower schools, and uh, and I'll use that as a way to illustrate what uh, what it is. Um, and uh, uh, at the end, I'll stop uh, a few minutes early to take questions and make that work. Um, so. Uh, I um, uh, had a rough start to my academic career. I, I, uh, I think I missed recess, must have been at least half the time in first grade. Uh, and, uh, and I was uh, on a path to that in second grade because uh, I couldn't sit still. And the logical conclusion for kids who couldn't sit still uh, was to skip recess. And, um, and uh, I had the good fortune, my parents decided to move cities. Uh, and when we, were in, when we were moving to the new city of Minneapolis, uh, they decided to look for a different kind of school um, for wayward boys, and uh, and they were introduced to the idea of Montessori, and uh, and I switched from a really traditional school to a Montessori school, uh, and it really changed my life. I was in a place where I could uh, wander around uh, in the process of trying to learn things, and that didn't seem to bother anybody. And for five years, I had a great academic experience. Um, uh, Eventually, I returned to a traditional school, and it didn't quite work again. But uh, but for for five years, I had a feeling that education could be uh, designed in a way that would work for somebody like me. Um, I'm going to fast forward a lot to uh, uh, I spent ten years working at Teach for America, uh, and uh, and I helped grow Teach for America. And last a year and a half ago or so, in the September of, uh, September October of 2015, uh, I left Teach for America. And, uh, and I had the good fortune to take a little time to decompress because uh, it had been a busy decade there. And, um, and after I sort of caught my breath, I realized that there were sort of two things that were on my mind that I was interested in considering. Uh, one of them was Montessori related because of my own experience and also because Montessori didn't really work in the context of Teach for America. Teach for America was organized around the idea that we would get in people who were not choosing to enter the field of education. Uh, and one of the things you learn when you talk to folks on college campuses is they want to make a difference right away. And it takes a fast path into working directly with kids, or those folks won't join. So uh, Teach for America's model for how we train teachers was always designed around the idea of what can you do that works with the type of people we're recruiting. And so I had set my Montessori interests aside for a decade, and I was interested in that. And the other thing I was interested in was technology, uh, because when I was 21, I thought I was going to do a tech startup, and then I didn't. Uh, and now I have gray hair, and it's 20 years later, and I still was interested in the subject. And, um, and so as I was thinking about these two topics, I, uh, I decided to dive in and learn more about ed tech. I didn't know much about it. Many of the people in this room probably know more about it than I do. Uh, and I started by going to visit some schools that had the reputations of doing a good job with technology. Uh, and uh, and at, the, at the time, the sort of blended learning type programs I was visiting, uh, I'd go in and I would see, and you guys have probably all seen this, I would see relatively young kids uh, sitting in front of computers for relatively long periods of time. Uh, and, and I just had this overwhelming feeling of I would never let my kids do this. Um, and and I, I know the people who create these schools. These are friends and colleagues from, uh, that I know from my Teach for America days. And I believe both in their intentions and their capabilities. And so I followed up with folks and I said, can you just walk me through, like I had this reaction that I wouldn't, that I didn't feel right to me, but I believe in you. So can you just walk me through, how did we get here? Uh, and I heard stories that I'm sure you all have heard before of, uh, of sort of recognizing that the pedagogy isn't ideal. The pedagogy of kids with big headphones on in front of computers isn't ideal. But on the other hand, uh, there were real values that people were getting out of the technologies. They were getting the ability to differentiate in a way that even the most energetic uh, teachers in front of uh, kids were not able to handle uh, in ways that were relevant for kids, even though they were on average of several years behind. Uh, they were in individually in all sorts of different places. That they got value in terms of feedback that, you know, we've all been in situations where there's some center set up in a classroom and uh, some kid will be doing something wrong for like an hour before a teacher gets around to correct it. Uh, and that doesn't happen anymore if you have a computer there. And we'd get data at the end of the day that would let us figure out who was getting things right and wrong and we could use that to adjust course the next day. And so, even though we weren't thrilled about the pedagogy, we found real value in these things. And, and you know, one thing I heard again and again was, 
we don't do things around here just because we like them. We try them, and if they work, then we keep doing them, and this works better, uh, and that's why we do it. And, uh, and so I walked away from these conversations uh, just feeling like maybe there was a door number three somewhere, like it was unsatisfying uh, that that was the only two choices available. And I was trying to figure out whether there was some way to create some alternative way of thinking about educational technology. Um, and, uh, and I thought about that for a minute, and what I realized is that I actually don't know enough about cognitive neuroscience and learning sciences to put my finger on exactly what it was about the screens that I was seeing that was bugging me, and it was sort of hard to think about some alternative in the context of not really being able to articulate what I didn't like about what I was seeing. And so I went off on this wandering to talk to people who uh, do work in cognitive neuroscience and to read books about it. And, uh, and, I, and I had this experience, you know, and this again may be things that you all know, but it was really, it was fascinating to me. What I learned basically was this, this, this explosion of methods uh, in the field of learning and development science over the last 20, 30 years. We can like basically put an MRI helmet on a kid and see their brain light up as, uh, as they're doing stuff. And it's given us ways to think about what is happening to kids when they learn that's radically different from what we've ever had in the past. And what we've basically concluded from the last 20 years or 30 years of research on this stuff is that Dewey and Piaget and Maria Montessori were right 100 years ago. Uh, that the basic ideas that they had articulated of, uh, you know, and these things all strike us as pretty good common sense now, but like kids learn more when they are doing things they're interested in. Uh, when they are exploring things uh, and experiencing the things to learn instead of having them explained to them. When they are working in open-ended exploration environments instead of closed-ended environments. When they move while they learn. While they take things in in multi-sensory ways. While they learn concrete ideas and build abstractions on top of them. Like that is all old stuff and that is what we just uh, uh, re-demonstrated with all this fancy new equipment. And the problem with it, obviously, is if you think about the context of like a kid sitting in front of a computer trying to learn from it, I mean, unless the thing you're learning is to type or to code, you can't do any of those things. You know, the topic was picked by a programmer. The limitations of the experience are closed-ended by the programmer. Uh, it's not multi-sensory. It's not experiential. It's abstract. Um, I, I was reminded of a study that I had read once of a situation where uh, uh, Researchers created two types of manipulative objects to teach kids how to do number operations. One set of manipulative objects were like Montessori uh, tools. They were you know, little wooden blocks that do things. And the other were, was an iPad that basically created a virtual representation of the same wooden blocks. And the question was, how do those two, uh, how do those two learning methods impact the kids? As they had two groups, each of them worked with a different thing. Uh, and then they gave them a post-test at the end of the year. And both sets of kids did equally well in sort of basic standardized test style questions of number operations. Then they tested both groups two years later and they gave them two types of tests. One was another test of standardized test type number operations questions and the other was harder questions that required more conceptual uh, uh, understanding of the number operations. Again, two years later, both kids did equally well on the first one and the kids who worked with the real block did dramatically better on the second one. Uh, and I just thought this was fascinating, that it, it like not just the idea that they were working with these manipulative objects, but something specific about the physical, touchable manipulative objects that created a really different uh, learning impact on the kids. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, you know what, actually I'm not sure that this is a solvable problem to, uh, to come up with uh, a computer solution to this. And, uh, and so I started thinking uh, I may have hit a dead end here. Um, and See if I can make this work. Here we are. Um, and then I had the second thought of, uh, I wonder what Maria Montessori would do if she were here with us, because she was a scientist. She actually loved the technology of her day, which was actually some strange stuff like skull measuring technology and things like this. Uh, but, uh, but she was a scientist, and, uh, and, I was and I was sort of wondering, like, I wonder what she would do today if she were here in the environment of all these new technologies would she have come to the same conclusions? And so I, I sort of started talking to Montessorians and asking them this question, like what would Maria Montessori be working on today? And, and I heard two things from people. Um, the first, I guess, was not surprising. I, I, I heard from a lot of Montessorians, you know, the basic method she took, which was to 
sort of serve as an educational anthropologist to watch kids, to see what they did, to operate under the premise that the things that they were drawn to were that like that was an important sign uh, about their interests and their motivations, and that you should design a physical environment around them that would work with the blueprint that was inside of them that was seeking to express itself in the world. Uh, the, the underlying dynamics of that thing that she observed, those were wired into human beings 100,000 years ago in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. They haven't changed in the last 100 years, and she would have come to the exact same conclusions today, so don't show your kids any iPads. Um, the second thing I heard was, was different, and it was sort of the thing that led me down uh, the path I'm gonna talk a little bit more about here, of, uh, of people said, you know, if you go back and read her books, uh, Maria Montessori uh, wrote about the idea of the teacher as scientist, and that the core role of the teacher was not actually to teach, and this was a core problem of uh, teaching in her day. Uh, the core role of the teacher was to watch really carefully, to take incredibly detailed notes on what every kid is doing all the time, which things they're working on, how long, how much focus they can met, demonstrate, how much independent choice they make over materials, and use those as a way to continually adjust the environment every day. Uh, sort of an empirical daily uh, evolution of a classroom and lesson presentation methodologies. And, uh, and I, I heard that, I thought that's fascinating, and I went to talk to some Montessori teachers I knew and asked how that works in practice, and heard what you sort of could imagine. People were just like, yeah, that really doesn't work. You can't do that. Like, there's 30 kids, and this one poked that one in the eye with a pencil, and I've got all these forms to fill out, and it can't be done. And so I started thinking about the question of whether you could use the sorts of technologies that we've all gotten used to, of gyroscopes and accelerometers and proximity sensors that are in your cell phone and have become parts of our lives, and put them inside of Montessori materials, uh, so that the materials themselves could report out to the teacher who was using them for how long and with what type of focus. Uh, and, and I got totally excited about this idea, and I actually got relatively close to starting this as a for-profit company, when uh, one of the uh, folks I was talking to about investing in it said, you know, there's, I've got this friend of a friend who's at MIT uh, who has some similar interests to you, you should meet him. And so I get introduced to this guy named Sepp Kamvar, uh, and Sepp's claim to fame was when he was a graduate student uh, in computer science at Stanford, he invented the algorithm that allowed a search engine to produce a personalized result for the user, uh, which back in 1999 couldn't be done. Uh, he started a company, Google bought it for a small fortune, uh, and he spent the half dozen years at Google, became the head of personalization there, and then retired at like 30 years old. Uh, and uh, disappeared for a little while, reemerged as the head, as a professor of computer science at Stanford, and then, uh, and then was hired to run the social computing lab at MIT. And so he moves across the country, and his wife assigns him the task of finding a preschool for their two-year-old. Uh, and because he had a lot of money, and he was a professor with a lot of free time, uh, after visiting some schools and concluding he didn't see exactly what he wanted, he decided to create his own school. Uh, and so, uh, so I go out to meet him, and, uh, and he shows me the school. Uh, and the, the first reaction I had to when I saw it is, that it was just beautiful. Like it was, uh, it was not like schools I had seen, um, and uh, and it was a place that had all sorts of things that when I was looking for schools for my kids, uh, I had been looking for and couldn't find in one place. It was it was this tiny little school. It was an authentic Montessori school. The teachers didn't seem like they were employees. They seemed like they were just totally empowered and they were running their own school. Um, it had this uh, natural environment of like all these plants had sort of uh, uh, were all over the place in a way that was much more intense than I had seen in any uh, Montessori environment. It was in a little shop front, and you can see the window at the front on a regular city street. So like the world was looking in at the kids, and the kids were looking out at the world. And uh, and I obviously was not the only person to have this reaction to it because uh, after he created this first school. Some people uh, uh, waitlist forms for it, and people say, could we get a second one? He helped them create a second, and then new waitlist, and a third. And then people on the streets of Cambridge are like walking by and looking in and saying, I want one for my kids, and calling, and so he creates four and five and six. And then the government of Puerto Rico calls and uh, says, would you come down and talk to us about this? So he goes down there, and he talks to some folks in the Department of Education down there, and they say, could we get 100 of them? Uh, and he laughs and says, no, I'm a professor, uh, but I could, I'll, I'll help you with two. So he helps create two in Puerto Rico, and this is when I met him. The two in Puerto Rico had just opened up, and, um, 
And, uh, and uh, you know, after seeing this, he also has this group of, uh, of engineers at the Media Lab who are trying to be helpful. And they've cooked up the idea of taking sensors and putting them in the slippers of the kids. Uh, and, uh, and they can report, it, these are proximity sensors, so they sort of report when they're near another proximity sensor. And he's able to produce a report for the teachers at the end of the day that says how they allocated their time across all the kids. Uh, and the teachers find this very helpful because you lose track of how you spend your time in a child-directed environment over the course of a day and week. And the teachers were like, oh, I, you know, I really had in my mind that I should try to avoid spending too much time with this particular kid uh, because they need more independence. But I didn't realize I actually hadn't like, been within three feet of the kid in four days. Uh, and, um, and so I said to him, and I, I said, you know, you're going to have to forgive me for what is not going to sound super humble because you're a famous computer scientist and I'm not. Um, but I think you're building the technology wrong. Because uh, I think in Montessori, we should be wiring up the materials, not the kids. And I'm about to start a company to do this. So why don't, why don't we work together? You can keep building these tools. I'll build technology. And Seth is this kind of you know, zen character. And he says, we could talk about that if you want. But would you mind if we talked about Uber and Taxi Magic first? Uh, and I was like, uh, OK. Does anyone remember Taxi Magic? Not so many. Uh, Taxi Magic had Uber's idea first. Uh, uh, but the, what they were going to do is they were going to take the existing taxis in the country and they were going to put GPS devices in them uh, and they were going to uh, uh, allow you to order from your cell phone, uh, see all the cabs, press the button. But the taxi companies didn't want that to happen. So what ended up happening on the Taxi Magic app is you'd see all the cabs, you'd click one, and then it would connect you to the dispatcher who would actually send it to you. Uh, and they were supposed to get this like $5 referral fee from the taxi companies who didn't want to pay that. And at the end of the day, Uber comes along and looks at the situation and says, you know what, we need our own cars. Uh, and of course, we know how that ended up. And, and Seth says, the same thing's going to happen with this idea. You're going to try to get Montessori teachers to change the way they do things to take advantage of what, what is profoundly important information of like real-time information about what the kids actually are doing and even what they know, whether they're using materials in a way that represents knowing how to do things. And they're not going to change enough and they're going to think that the technology isn't that important, and they're not going to give you the amount of money you would need to develop this right. You need your own schools. And as it turns out, um, I have a bunch of schools here, but I'm trying to be a professor. So if you'll do something with them uh, useful, you can take them. Uh, and so I thought about this for a week, and I thought that's the strangest uh, coincidence in the world. And so, uh, so Sepp and I started working together. And uh, uh, what I wanted to show is just a few of the things that sort of Wildflower, sort of since we started working together, is about. One of them is this technology I talked about. And it's the idea that we can embed sensors in the environment, in these lesson trays, actually in materials themselves, in kid slippers, in a way that we can take essentially the things that are the goals of formative assessment that unfortunately re requires lots of quizzing uh, and testing of kids or time in front of screens, that we can actually get all of that extracted from the environment without the kids knowing it. We can have a kid who is using an abacus, and we can have a, uh, some combination of sensors and cameras on the abacus so that we can actually see when they pull out a six tile, and they pull out a three tile, and they set them in a little tray, and they start moving beads, whether they get the three beads, and then the six beads, and they end up with the nine. We can actually tell whether they know how to do addition without them stopping to be quizzed. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're working on, is sort of a way to bring together the world of outcome-oriented teaching with the world of child-directed learning environments. Second thing we're doing is creating a platform, uh, using the model that these first schools were created, creating a platform by which teachers can run their own schools. Uh, and so it's a very decentralized system in which a teacher who wants to create a school just like these tiny little micro schools, two teachers, 25 kids, uh, in a shop front on a regular city street, using the uh, natural, beautiful environment uh, that we saw in those prior pictures, um, using the principles of uh, scientific pedagogy and authentic Montessori, that we can create a platform where a teacher says, you know what, I, I, I trained as a Montessorian a number of years ago, and, um, and I love the beauty of the Montessori approach. Uh, I love the peaceful communities Montessori aspires for for kids. But uh, actually, my school, the relationship between the adults is anything but Montessori. It's like command and control. Uh, there's a principal, there's the boss, and there's teachers, and they have assistants, and they have aides, and everyone tells, you know, everything flows straight downhill. And I want to be in an environment where the sort of vision I've always had for what uh, a school should be, where I can bring that to life. 
And so that's the second thing we're working on is creating a principle driven, uh, principle not the teacher type, but uh, uh, the other kind of principle, uh, driven environment where, uh, where I can express uh, my vision for what a school should be and create this, this sort of much less institutional feeling uh, school environment uh, where families and teachers and kids come together as a group project to follow life's unfolding journey. And, uh, and it turns out that this uh, struck a chord with teachers. So we're sort of not really marketing this yet um, because we're working on the technologies that make it possible for a teacher to both teach all day and administer their own independent school. Uh, right now our teachers are working like 80 hours a week, 40 hours of both. Uh, but we think we can get the administrative work down to like five hours a week. And so we're busy hammering away at that using technology. Um, and, uh, and as we do so, like people sort of tell their friends, hey, I'm running my own school and it's, you can do this too. And so we're up to, uh, this is just a map of where the calls are coming from. Um, uh, but we're getting now a dozen calls a week from teachers uh, who would like to start their own school somewhere. Um, and, I, and I think the, uh, the last thought I'll share here is um, I think in this we have sort of stumbled on some more fundamental questions about how exactly we ended up where we are in education. Like, like why exactly did we make the choice 125 years ago to abandon one-room schools in favor of sort of Prussian uh, education factories? Like, if you go back and look at it, there actually wasn't any evidence supporting that at the time. It was a fad and it just caught on. Uh, and it has so many negative consequences, like achievement gaps are dramatically higher uh, in bigger schools than smaller schools. Teacher satisfaction is lower. Parent satisfaction is lower. Kid satisfaction is lower. The, the, uh, you know, we're, we have the environmental implications of people getting bussed all over the place. We have the destruction of community implications of people going to these impersonal schools far outside of their normal environments. Like all of these things came out of a set of decisions that actually almost nobody intended to make. And so what Wildflower is fundamentally about is sort of about returning to a more human model of education delivery, one where that fits into our lives, that fits into our communities better, where kids are at the center of their own learning, uh, and where the technologies and the tools are sort of brought into the background uh, as ways to support the more human activity of learning. That's it. Zero to 18, every school follows one Montessori three-year age band, so a zero to three school or a three to six school, et cetera. Uh, in Cambridge, where we've, the schools have been popping up the fastest, uh, we have uh, eight schools in about a mile and a half stretch that cover different ages, and people go to one, and then they go to another. I think I've got like two minutes left, so if anyone has other questions, I can take them now, or otherwise we can end. Uh, so the schools follow a bunch of different um, financial models, uh, and our general concept is they can follow any model they want so long as it is sustainably able to uh, uh, support a student body that approximately represents the economic distribution in the country, like about a third free and reduced lunch, about a third what we might call working the middle class, about a third middle plus. Um, and so uh, the first schools in Cambridge uh, used tuition for higher income families and scholarships for lower income families. Uh, then um, as the scholarship thing started hard to replicate, we cr had a school in northern Massachusetts that used Massachusetts state childcare vouchers in pre-K uh, for low income families. And that is a sustainable solution for mixed income schools. The two schools in Puerto Rico that we are operating right now uh, are actually hosted by the district, uh, so they are free to everyone. We just got our first charter approved in Minnesota a few weeks ago. Uh, and an, we're working on one in Massachusetts right now. And the idea basically is that these things are teeny. They're these little one-room things, and they can fit into lots of different contexts. And as long as the funding model for those contexts is appropriate, and the context creates this legal wrapper in which the teacher can actually lead uh, without being bothered by the uh, bureaucratic structures that surround it, then we're fine with any of them. The teacher leadership is, is extremely central to the idea. So we have a lot of tools and supports available when a teacher comes to us and says, I'd like to create a wildflower school. Um, but uh, but it's, not, uh, it's not tightly controlled. It's, tight, it's, it's heavily helped, but not tightly controlled. So we just go to the franchise model? 
it's like a nonprofit franchise model. We're a nonprofit, they're a nonprofit, but the concept, like the basic concepts that exist in franchising apply. Okay, I'm done.